the mission of ARENA is to lower the barriers of entry for new entrants into the political process, new candidates. And uh, the four candidates here are all members of our community and have been involved essentially since that day where uh, after the election when I started calling people through asking what are we gonna do? Um, and so uh, I actually think uh, Ken, I think I called you that day or the day after and, um, and Andy and then I met Haley and Lauren uh, at Arena One and we've been talking ever since. I'm gonna give you a brief background of our, our, our candidates and uh, each one of these folks is running for U.S. Congress. Um, so let's give it up for them. Um, and uh, apologies if I get the numbers of these districts wrong, but I think I'm right. Uh, Ken is, is from Akron. Um, he's running in Ohio 7. Uh, he is a former pilot in the Navy and uh, a Yale Law grad. Uh, do we have some Yale Law in the house? A little bit? No? There. <laughs> They're quiet, they're shamed, they're shamed. Uh, they, uh, the, he also founded an organization called Team Rubicon, which has deployed, uh, we have some Team Rubicon people here, has deployed uh, thousands and thousands of folks, or at least signed up thousands and thousands of uh, former, uh, 50,000 former and current service members who uh, deployed to disaster relief areas. Uh, and so uh, Ken could talk uh, a lot more about that work and, and his career in service. We also have Haley Stevens. Um, um, Haley's running in Michigan 11. Michigan 11, anybody here from Michigan 11? Yeah! All right. Um, so uh, she was the chief of staff uh, to the auto task force in the US Treasury Department. She also headed up two different, or at least, uh, Start, help start two federal offices that have been critical to job growth here in Michigan and recently launched her candidacy. Uh, and uh, raise your hand if you've already been um, tapped to be involved in this campaign already. All right, good, so we're, we're on our way. We wanna see a lot more hands by the end of the day there. Um, we also have Andy Kim. Uh, uh, Andy Kim is, uh, most importantly, the star of the first Arena podcast. I think that's all you need to know about him. <laughs> no, he, uh, he is a uh, Rhodes Scholar uh, and went on to, uh, to uh, advise both David Petraeus in Afghanistan and then uh, President Obama on ISIS at the White House. And uh, he is running in New Jersey 3 against Representative MacArthur. Raise your hand if you know who Ma Representative MacArthur is. Yeah. The MacArthur Amendment, which we'll talk about, uh, was, was critical to the passage of the Obamacare repeal. And then we have Lauren Underwood from Illinois 14. <laughs> I feel like I'm, 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 name, I'm giving names at a graduation. <laughs> Hold your applause. Um, so Lauren is a former nurse, and she's now a senior director at Next Level Health. She was also an appointee in the Obama administration at HHS. All right. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. So uh, first question for our candidates is the most obvious one, which is, uh, why are you running? Great question, Ravi, and thanks for, thanks for everything. Thanks for pulling this together. It's such an inspiration to be in a room like this, and I'll level with you. On November 9th, when I explained to my daughters what we had just done as a country, and put them on the school bus, and thought, what next? My wife turned to me and she said, you have to do something. If not you, who? If not now, when? And my initial motivation was to show my girls that sometimes you fight back even when there's no chance. That was the initial thinking. That thinking has changed. We can win this. We can win the Ohio 7th, which is a red district. The reason I got in initially was to make my kids proud and to live up to that oath of office I took as a Navy pilot. I'm in it now to win it, to beat the other guy because the stakes are life and death. And. I, I know this is going to sound old-fashioned, but if I had to boil it down to one word, it would be patriotism. 
I served my country overseas, and to see it being, over the course of the last election cycle, torn apart from within was something I couldn't abide. I'm in it because I love my country. I think we need more people in Washington who put country first and party second. Unless we begin doing that, we're not going to dig out of this rut. We're not going to right this ship. Thanks, Rob. Hey. For, for me, it's this question of what does our future look like? What does our future both individually and collectively look like? And what scares me and frightens me is I don't know that this question is out there and I see dramatically different paths that our nation could take. And for me, uh, I, 21 months ago, I became a father and all of a sudden, Woo. you know, my, my, all of a sudden my future is his future. It's my wife's future. It's all of our futures. And I'm trying to understand what that all means. And for me, where that comes down is that I do not want to take our democracy for granted anymore. I want to make sure that I don't assume that anyone else will stand up and fight for me. So what I'm trying to do and what I'm looking at doing and putting this together is making sure that we stand up and we fight for this because we can take back the Jersey third, we can flip the house, and we can take back the White House. And I think that that's how we get our country back on track. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lauren from the Illinois 14th. And so I was in the Obama administration until the very last day. And so uh, leaving, leaving government, I was uh, focused on going back home, right? It's so important to not forget about our hometowns and where we're from and the, some of the challenges that are back home. And so, so when I looked around my community and saw who was representing us in the way that he does not reflect our values, does not, I have no faith in his leadership, absolutely none. Um, and he is a far right Tea Party guy in a moderate district and there's no reason he should be reelected, quite frankly. Um, and so in looking around, and looking around, I said, you know, who, who's going to step up, right? Who's going to step up, who shares my values, who is ready and prepared to lead, who's committed to service? And I didn't see anyone stepping forward. And so I realized, you know, I have what it takes. We have what it takes. We can lead. We just have to make that sacrifice and step forward and turn to the arena. And so I'm proud at this point to be thinking about running. Potential candidate, not official yet thinking about it. So this is about unprecedented circumstance meeting profound opportunity. So my name's Haley Stevens. I've been running for Congress in Michigan's 11th district for a little over a month. And I'm doing this because Michigan matters, because the people who live here matter and what happens here matters. So my life has been about putting up my hand not when somebody has told me, but because of big opportunities and big experiences. This is when I was a kid from Michigan, coming out of the Obama campaign, working on transition, sitting there and thinking, what is happening in my home state? We are at 15% unemployment. People are wondering how they're going to put food on the table. They're wondering about their future. And so I put up my hand and I asked to work on the auto rescue. That was two million jobs saved. That was about America's innovation economy. That was about our maker economy. And for me, right, you guys, what this spawned was a career working at the intersection of industry and government where we can come together for solutions. So I've spent almost the last 10 years crawling around manufacturing shop floors, working on different job creation opportunities. In November, I was working in an advanced manufacturing research lab on a workforce development program. And yet again, there I found myself, what can I do for Michigan? And so I put up my hand, I started talking, and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> And uh, to give you a sense of Haley, for those of you at the reception last night, she was walking around with a clipboard signing up volunteers yesterday. 
It uh, doesn't stop. <laughs> that's how it's done. Uh, next question, and this could be a short one because this is kind of a, a shameless self-promotion, but uh, Haley and Lauren in particular, tell us a little bit about uh, Arena One and how that uh, factored into your decision to run and, and just think about running. So I was already looking at precinct data on November 10th, right? I was wondering, okay, how can I get this done? Because you guys, we're all here, because it's not necessarily about yesterday, it's about today, and it's about what we can do for tomorrow, period. So I got to work, and lo and behold, Ravi and Aaron Fitzgerald and Michael Simon and Jason Green had gotten to work too. And so this is kind of about somebody thinking about something and meeting an opportunity, which you had presented, which is what's next and how do we get to work? So I was right there in Nashville, sitting in the front row, taking copious notes of which I wrote by hand and then typed up afterwards, absorbing, right? Because I had been working in a manufacturing research lab. How do you run for Congress? How do you make a difference? I got smart. It's about the activity of listening and engaging and connecting that community. I know I'm in a room here full of so many people from Michigan because you all are a part of the groundswell. There's real activity happening here in Michigan. And so we're stepping up and what Arena is doing is you're keeping us together, Ravi. How great, we're in a room full of friends and this is so special. So thank you, it's meant a lot to me. Well, thank you. Uh, coming out of Nashville, uh, Nashville was so important uh, to reorient my thinking about running and making it in the forefront of my mind, right? I don't know if you share this, this desire to serve, right? And it's always maybe something that we might do one day. Um, and so what that time in Nashville did was made it more immediate. Uh, and then to, to be a part of a cohort, either a regional cohort or among, you know, peers who are also thinking about running, that we can be accountability partners, support systems, share information, right? Um, the, the network has been so valuable as I continue to explore Run for Congress, uh, really just connecting with very, very, very valuable resources. So I encourage you all who are here, who are thinking about it, don't dismiss it, don't put it off, run, run. And then also uh, talk with your neighbor sitting next to you uh, because these folks are brilliant and um, are energized to help, help take you across the finish line. Great. Uh Just to show hands from our panelists, uh, if, if your opponent or potential opponent uh, voted to repeal Obamacare, uh, just let us know. Um, all right, that's everybody. Uh, so starting with Andy and anybody else could jump in, um, is that vote going to be central to your messaging in, in your campaign? And uh, if it is, give us, uh, give us a little bit of that inside talk. We, we know, there's only cameras here and tons of people with phones, so th this won't get out at all. But give us, <laughs> give us the playbook. What, what, what are you going to say? Like, how are you going to message this? So the day that I went public that I was exploring this run was the day that Representative Tom MacArthur, my representative from the Jersey 3rd, uh, released publicly the MacArthur Amendment. Uh, this was not, I did not wake up that morning like ready to say, I'm gonna publicly announce this, <laughs> that I'm gonna be doing this thing. It was that I read through the MacArthur Amendment, which is uh, what revived Trump care, which is what created state waiver uh, process that gutted protections for pre-existing conditions. I read that and immediately I just started calling some of my friends and I said, I think I gotta do this today. And uh, so for me, it was just right there at the gut of looking at this and seeing how many tens of thousands of people this is gonna hurt in the Jersey third, how many millions of people this is gonna hurt across this country. And what I remembered was uh, draw back to this moment where uh, my very first job was as an organizer at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. And I had an opportunity there to speak with lots, with hundreds of families that have become homeless. And I remember hearing their stories, how that happened. And the stories all blurred together because they were very much the same. It was a story in which they said, uh, one month my kid got sick, or my husband got sick, or my wife got sick, and I had to choose between my rent and my health care. And that's why they're homeless. So when we're saying, when we're talking about fighting for people's health care, it's about everything. 
because it affects every aspect of our life, and that's what we're trying to do, and that's what we're trying to fight for, and that's why we're trying to stop people like Representative Tom MacArthur and others who are putting profits before people's care, who are forgetting, and they don't believe in these core principles that I do, that healthcare is a right, and everyone should be able to have health care, no matter if they're rich or poor. And that's why we're fighting. This is the central issue for the vast majority of my constituents. Because as was just said, it affects everything. And it's easy to get lost in the numbers. The 23 million Americans who are going to have the rug ripped out from under them, the hundreds of thousands in my district who are likely to have their pre-existing conditions denied. The way we're talking about it, though, and this is easy for me to do, is to make it personal. My daughter, Lizzie, was born needing four surgeries before she turned four years old. And we scheduled the first one of those without any way to pay for it. Some of you may have seen the, uh, the picture that Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel sent out of, of, of his kid on that operating table. Uh, my <laughs> finance director will tell you I got a pretty thick skin, but that was one I couldn't look at because that was my daughter. That's how you boil down those numbers into an emotional appeal to people, your neighbors in the district. It, the, the monstrosity of a health care bill that is about to be foisted upon us is one of the cruelest pieces of legislation that anyone has ever seen. And unless we make it personal for our neighbors, unless we talk about the effect it's going to have on their lives, on their neighbors' lives, on their grandparents' lives, uh, we're not going to get the message across. This is a life and death issue. And to answer the question, it is absolutely central to our campaign. I just want to add, um, I'm a registered nurse, have taken care of patients, patients who are uninsured, underinsured, and have full coverage, right? This is personal for me. This is what I do professionally. Um, I am currently on marketplace coverage, but probably more importantly than my work and the fact that I currently have uh, this ACA coverage is that I worked for five years for the federal government to set up the marketplaces. I understand how it works, and we needed someone in Congress who, one, understands health care, right? How many of these people voted for the bill and didn't read it? Um, obviously, they didn't. Uh, the president hasn't read it, doesn't understand health care, right? And so they are making these laws that impact our lives every single day and have no idea what they're doing. Um, and so I'm going to make it an issue. People raise it with me every day when we go to these meetings, and um, they're going to be held accountable for that vote. So I'm, I'm running against the third wealthiest member of Congress. A man named Dave Trot, who's in his, th thank you friends, thank you, who made a bunch of his money off of running a home foreclosure business. So while I was busy saving jobs, Dave was doing what he was doing, and he voted for that bill, and he stood right behind President Trump in the Rose Garden. That is not leadership. That is not progress. That is wrong. <laughs> Period. Awesome. So uh, this will be our last question. Um, and shout out to our diligent timekeepers back there. Uh, I'm afraid of you. I, I, I promise I'll do this fast. The, uh, so uh, last question is, uh, each panelist here has a record of service, whether it's service uh, domestically or service uh, in national security. And you're running against people who seem to have breached the, the contract of service in many ways with their constituents. Um, how? Has your service informed the values that you hold and will be communicating uh, to your voters? So when I was 22, I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Not any individual, not a president, certainly not a party. And when I was leading combat reconnaissance crews overseas, the way we deployed, one airplane, one crew, we lived by some really simple rules. The most basic of which was, everything that happens on this plane as aircraft commander is my responsibility. I kind of took for granted what that distilled down to, which was duty. But I've been thinking a lot about that word lately because 
I don't think it means what it used to, certainly not for all too many people we're sending to Washington today. I've read the oath of office that representatives swear. It's to the Constitution. It's not to the president. It sure as hell isn't to the party. And I think we're seeing what happens when representatives put party first. We've got, in my district, a guy who votes literally in lockstep with the party leadership. That is not representative democracy. That is not representative democracy. We need to return to that basic concept of duty. We need to remind our representatives that their oath is to the Constitution and their duty is to us. That's what I learned in the Navy, and that's what I hope to bring to Washington. Awesome. For me, service is such a critical issue, uh, such a critical word. I mean, for me, the way I see it is that public service is not a job for me. It's a way of life. It's something, it's where, it's how I conduct myself. It's how I in engage and interact with the people around me. And I think about this one line that uh, you know, President Obama said once in a meeting in, in the Situation Room, which was, you know, in this room, I've never asked for a guarantee because he understands just how chaotic things are. And what I took out of that and that experience working with him was that individuals matter, that every day is a fight, and that we really need champions both inside and outside of government, talking to each other, working with each other, and that's how change happens. That's how we get progress, and that's what service means. It doesn't have to be in government, but it's a way of life. It's how we conduct ourselves, and it's understanding our responsibility to the people around us. So that's how I approach this, and that's why uh, I use service as my anchor, that for me, it's how I uh, engage in every aspect of my life. Service is so important. I uh, was a federal employee for many years, right? And so it was such an honor to be able to serve the American people. Uh, but part of that was a responsibility to maintain some integrity. Uh, and so to me, part of that is uh, stewardship over taxpayer funds, right? Not being wasteful. Um, and then also that heavy responsibility of truly representing the voters. Uh, I am represented by a member of Congress who doesn't want to meet with folks, who doesn't want to be responsive and help be held accountable for his votes on our behalf. Um, and so I'm going to be weaving in this idea of service and integrity um, should I decide to run because it, it's just, it's that important and um, critical to the role of representative. So for me, this is about accessible leadership and the role that government can play for people. And a story that I'd love to share with you all is when I was working in the Treasury Department on that auto rescue, you know, when we were staring kind of the unknown in the eye, I decided I wanted to be the open line to people. That anybody who could make their way to my phone, I would pick it up, I would listen to them, I would cry with them, and I would hear from them. And there was one man in particular here in, in Michigan who was running a metals business. And he would call and he would talk to me about his company and he would explain to me how worried he was. And he'd say, I'd really like to come visit you in Washington. I'm going to come visit. And I said, that's great. I'd love for you to come. Come visit our office. And so one day, Mr. Metals Manufacturer, he would do the bumpers on cars. He, we booked the meeting, and he came into the Treasury Department. I met him at the front with his huge hunk of metal. And he said, I want to show you what I make. And it seems funny, right? But it was important because what that man did was important. It was important for his family and the people that he employed. And that's what this is about. That's what our new message is, you, you guys, right now. It is about your work, your life, your health, our environment. That's what matters. That's why we do what we do. That's why we step up in moments like this. That's why I am running for Congress, and that is what I will do in the United States Congress. So. All right. So, uh, before we do the whole applause for uh, this panel, we have a few important items. Uh, one is you might be asking yourself, "What now? What, how do we? What do we do to help uh, 
some of these talented candidates that we have coming out of ARENA who have now entered the ARENA, uh, there are a few things you can do. Uh, some of them are immediate. So uh, one thing we've done is we're about to go into lunch and we will have breakouts. There are a couple different breakouts, but uh, I'm gonna make a, a personal plug for each one of these candidates is gonna be hosting a round table for lunch to focus on a discrete issue in their campaign. And um, I'm gonna give you, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, you can just give like a one line, what do you be focusing on? And then I'll give you all the room numbers. One of our biggest challenges in an R plus 12 is messaging across the aisle. But something is happening in Ohio. We just finished launch week. I don't know whose idea that was. It was equal parts exhausting and exhilarating. But something is happening in Ohio. We did an event in a heavily Republican town in a heavy, heavily Republican county in the, uh, the ballroom of the hotel. And the mayor came up to me afterwards and said, I couldn't find parking on the square. I couldn't find parking on the square. I was trying to figure out why, and when I walked in, I realized it's because of you. And in my 22 years as mayor, I have never seen this many people come out to hear what a politician had to say, much less a Democrat. <laughs> Something is happening in Ohio. And what I need help with is figuring out how to channel that energy on one side, that discontentment on the other, because we have the message, we have the moral high ground, we have the factual high ground, we need to get the word out. So, energy message. Right. Great. Uh, I'd love to work with you on thinking about ways in which we can build up our tech and social infrastructure, finding ways that we can nationalize this, recognizing that MacArthur didn't just do something that hurts the Jersey Third, but hurts us as a nation, and be able to really mobilize in that way and think of innovative ways we can build that out. Awesome. awesome. Hi, I'd like to talk about social media and messaging and the, some of the different tools uh, to get the word out about what's going on the 14th. Come spend some time. I'll be doing grassroots, which I know is near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, and we'll be talking about how we can engage neighbors, how we can build an operation, and invest in a foundation. So come join me. Thanks, guys.